to engage in the creative economy and hopefully find out ways you've been contributing, ways that you can contribute, and what this really means to the overall bigger picture. Uh, before we get into the panelists' questions, I'm just gonna give you guys a couple uh, facts to give you some context as to the creative economy. The value of the arts and culture production in America in 2019 was $919 billion, amounting to 4.3% of the GDP. The arts contribute more to the national economy than do construction, transportation and warehousing, travel and tourism, mining, utilities, and agricultural industries. Um, performing arts companies and independent artists, writers, performers added a combined total 60 billion to the US economy last reported in 2019. And America's nonprofit uh, arts industry generates 166 billion in economic activity every year, resulting in 27 and a half billion in federal, state, and local tax revenues. Well, without much further ado, I know everybody's wondering who this young lady is in the middle here, and also what a, a film commissioner is. So if we could start off, Sandy, uh, first off, what is a film commissioner? And tell us a little bit about your experience in Miami, what you're bringing to the table here. Okay, so uh, what a film commissioner is, or what I I want to say what I do as a film commissioner, that's not necessarily what all film commissioners do. First of all, first and foremost, I'm here to nurture the local creative and, you know, uh, bring together collaboratively. I'm here to bring in, you know, from the outside in production. Uh, and obviously that, you know, spells out in regards to uh, local artists as well as businesses um, financially into an economy. Uh, I'm in the educational sector. Hopefully that will happen here in Broward, um, where I uh, try to nurture students to be able to come out into a, into a, um, a you know, a film friendly environment and hopefully to, for them to stay here and to be employed here. And what else do I do? I mean, basically I'm marketing Broward County as a film uh, and television destination, as well as locally bringing everybody together to work together so that local, art, local uh, I was saying artists, but I, I call filmmakers artists, mm -hmm. local filmmakers can actually get their pro projects made, whether it's made in Broward County or it's made other, uh, otherwise because they're representing Broward County. So that's kind of, that's what a film commissioner does. And also on top of that, making policies film friendly. And that means throughout the county. So that means all the municipalities as well as the county itself. Um, coming from Miami-Dade County, so before I was in Miami-Dade County, I was a producer for um, 25 plus years. I won't say how many of those more years than that I was in, but I, was, I did start really young. Um, <laughs> we will say that. Um, and I haven't had plastic surgery yet. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I came to, to Miami-Dade County because actually I wanted to stay closer to home. I was raising my kids. I was a single mom and I needed to stay around. And the job came up um, under the, the, uh, the film commissioner. And when I was there about a month, and I knew the film commissioner, his name was Jeff Peel. He was my predecessor. And he said, you're going to be the next film commissioner. And within two years, I was. Um, so, uh, and in Miami-Dade County, it was very interesting because the, um, I want to say the community, and we were talking about this before um, started, the community, pretty disjointed, very competitive. And I think, it, um, I, I think that during the reign that I was there, I introduced people to people that started working together um, more collaboratively. And I think that it's a better place because of that. Did, still didn't finish my job there. I think that there's more to be done there. But, you know, when it comes to, you know, what I, what I attracted in, you know, I was in, I was in um, this position before incentives came into play. And I don't know if everybody knows about, you know, film incentives and how important they are into the industry or the business of the industry as being part of the business plan of how films are made. But we had no, we had a very small incentive and then we had a very large incentive and then we had no incentive. And so in that arc, I was in, in have been in, in the, uh, as a film commissioner and um, rode that arc. But during that time when we lost the state incentives and our 
you know, the, uh, the direct spend into the economy was going down, I lobbied for three years in Miami-Dade County to get, have a local incentive program that, um, when I left, brought in about $50 million of direct spend um, into the economy from production. So that was, you know, that was, uh, I was the first, uh, I want to say we were the first, Miami-Dade was the first to have an, a local incentive program, and then others in the state followed. So that's kind of a little bit about what he did. Very nice. And uh, Andrew, for those that aren't familiar uh, with film and the film industry specifically, how does the film industry fit into the creative economy? Why is it important? Well, I mean, the creative economy certainly kind of covers all of those creative fields and, and technology is certainly part of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, film being a big part of that, you know, being able to kind of showcase things from a visual standpoint. Uh, when we start looking at how film plays into Broward County specifically, um, I think it, it's a great opportunity for us to visually show all the incredible things that we have here, whether it's for tourists uh, to be able to visit. You know, when you look at a movie and you see a movie in, in a particular location, a lot of times you want to go visit that location if it's a really great movie. And so that's a really great kind of way that film could essentially kind of bring people into the economy here. Uh, obviously, I think, too, that um, being able to have more creative people uh, certainly kind of really helps everything else. So it kind of plays into all of the different aspects of business. And I um, think in a larger sense, um, uh, creative people are the ones that businesses want to hire. So a lot of businesses would look to relocate or locate their corporate offices in areas that have a really thriving creative environment and a lot of creative people. Uh, the creative economy, uh, I think, employs the largest number of people between 15 and 29. So a lot of times you find those are the people that are really, really young and coming out with these really creative ideas. And then it also bleeds into technology. So, you know, technology is certainly a major, major thing now. Digital is a major thing now. You look at things like Netflix that have kind of created these platforms for uh, film and, and filmmakers to be able to showcase their work to people around the world. Um, you see full, um, Netflix doing things uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, places in Korea and a bunch of other places. So, you know, there, there's the uh, the subtext now, you know, there's full full another language that you're kind of looking at a movie and, and you're kind of reading the subtitles. So I think uh, films are really, really big major player in the overall creative economy and, you know, looking forward to all the things you can get about. And when a film production company comes to mm -hmm. shoot a TV show, a movie or whatever it may be, they generally bring staff who has to stay in a hotel and eat food and take a <laughs> rental car and shop at the local coffee shop or the local businesses. And that money directly goes into the creative economy. Uh, so film production, when we were losing these incentives, mm -hmm. we were losing these major shoots, it really did hurt our overall economy. So we're very glad to have uh, Sandy here to help us right the ship. You want to? I just wanted to say something. You, know, you talked about um, about uh, visually and about what we call film-induced tourism. I have a funny story um, that kind of plays into that. So when I was um, years ago, I was uh, probably 2013. I was in 2012. I was in Manchester, England, for a you know a, a film-related um, event, and um, there to market Miami-Dade County. And I went into the um, uh, into the elevator. You had to have the, the bellhop. There was a bellhop, and he had to take your luggage. So we're in the elevator, and um, and he knows has no idea who I am, and um, and he's all really happy. And I'm like, why you look really happy? Why are you so happy? He goes, because I'm going on vacation tomorrow. I go, where are you going? He goes, I'm going to Miami. I go, I didn't say a word. I said, why are you going to Miami? He goes, he rolls up his sleeves and he said. He goes because we want to see where Miami Ink was shot, and he was all inked up on his sleeves. Yeah, so that so there it goes. That's that's <laughs> film induced tourism, right? Amen. Yeah. There's uh, some other really cool um, things happening this week that we didn't mention thus far, involving projections um, and another visual art form. If you guys didn't know, we have uh, Ignite Broward taking place this week. Phil, could you <laughs> tell us a little bit about uh, what we're in store for this week here? Sure. Um, Ignite, uh, and let me tell you, it took a long time to find a name because most names were, were taken. Uh, and uh, I, I won't go too much further into it. But, uh, so Ignite Broward is basically a uh, five-day five day, um, digital art-based um, uh, uh, festival. 
and what we're trying to do is build this into um, a signature event and part of a signature event uh, for Broward County. And so much focus is uh, now on, and it's it's a trend that's been happening for a long time, so it's not new. We're not reinventing any or inventing anything here, but but experiences, right? When people travel, they want they they want less of the sort of cookie cutter uh, touristy experience. They want to they want something unique, something local. Uh, when you visit an art museum, when you visit a cultural attraction, you want a unique experience. You don't just want to feel like you're there sitting as a, as a, in a sort of a two dimensional space as a passive participant, you want to be an active participant. And so uh, what we wanted to do is we, we wanted to um, uh, provide some immersive experiences. And of course, right around this time, it, it started because uh, <clears throat> when COVID was happening, we wanted to try and find some outdoor things uh, uh, for people to experience art. And we did some piloting last year. Uh, and, and this year, I, I think we've created a much more compelling um, uh, series of uh, art installations and, and they're site specific. So everything you're gonna see during Ignite uh, is designed and created specifically by the artists for the site. So you think of the building and the space as part of the uh, experience and part of the artwork. So we have three outdoor installations that are opening tomorrow. Uh, so around 6 p.m. Uh, at the Museum of Discovery and Science, there's uh, the public kickoff. It's free if folks want to come. There's going to be a food truck and a beer truck for purchase. We're not we, we're not providing free, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Mad Labs, which is our creative partner, is doing an immersive installation on the atrium of Mod. So I was just down there. Um, so imagine. Uh, three of those walls where that clock is, is going to be one large sound and light uh, projection map uh, art installation. In the park across the street, we're, we've, we're working with an artist collective, uh, Glowing Bulbs, and um, I'm, I would totally butcher the names of the artists because they're in from Germany that are installing these two installations. So the gazebo that's in Esplanade Park, uh, we've completely enclosed in a mesh and there's probably about eight projectors in there. So actually be able to walk into the gazebo. That's actually an interactive experience. So based on your movement and, and things, the, the art will change. In the trees uh, between the Park and Performing Arts Center are these uh, hanging cocoons that react to sound and, and um, uh, sound and movement. Uh, so you can walk through the trees and see these uh, cocoons, that's going to be visible from 6 p.m. till 10 p.m. Wednesday and Thursday and then till 11 p.m. Friday and Saturday and then Sunday till 10. So obviously it's outdoors. When it's dark, it's going to be better. So don't go during the day. You're not going to see anything. <laughs> and then in Dania Beach at Mad Studios, which is where the uh, Museum of Decorative Arts is, I see our friends from, from there. It's in the, the building that formerly housed the Gallery of Amazing Things is now where Mad Studios is, which is our creative partner. Uh, and they've got an amazing David Carson exhibition. He's sort of the godfather of graphic design existing that's in there. So you can go and see that. And then we have three indoor installations. One is an artist, Susan Narduli, who's an architect and artist uh, based out of L.A. We've commissioned her to do um, art installations on the Third Avenue Bridge and the Andrews Avenue Bridge. So we wanted to bring her in to do um, an indoor installation. Then David Carson is doing uh, an immersive installation. And then Edison Penyafil, who's uh, a South Florida uh, Broward artist um, whose work is very provocative, focuses a lot on immigration. You walk, actually walk into a room and you'll see uh, 80, uh, 81 figures in black and white, all in different boats. And basically it represents um, uh, migrants, people fleeing, um, you know, war-torn countries, whatever it might be uh, on these boats, but they're in this perpetual loop. And so he's 78 of the 81 figures. He creates the mask, the costumes, films. It's very, it's got sound and it's, it's it, but it provokes a conversation. So we've got a lot of different experiences uh, in the Ignite Festival and we're glad we're able to put it during Fort Lauderdale Art and Design to try and you know, aggregate as much kind of experiences as we can. And we're very glad to have it during the week, and we uh, couldn't go without saying uh, thank you, Broward County Culture Division, for the sponsorship and support of Fort Lauderdale and Design Week. So we're able to make events like this happen and get them out to the mass public through <laughs> running ads on NPR and running ads on TV and Facebook and Google. All these things take money let you guys know about them so that you can engage and take part of the festivities. Uh, Andrew, and uh, we'll also pass over to Phil afterwards what are some other areas of opportunity that you see for Broward County uh, specifically as it relates to arts and the creative economy um 
I mean, I think obviously the week, the week is, is a major part. I mean, being able to show the, the different opportunities that we have and different places that we have to go. Um, you know, places like the Frank, that's, that's a little bit further out west. I know sometimes, you know, when we're out east, we don't drive that far out west, but it's an incredible, incredible museum and gallery there. Coral Springs Museum, um, W Moda as well, a really incredible gem that we have there in Dania Beach. And they, they have hosted some really incredible events this past uh, this past couple of days, this past weekend. Mm -hmm. And there's some other events coming up as well. So, you know, I think letting people know about the things that, that we have is a major thing. And obviously the collaboration is huge. Um, I think the, the addition of film, I mean, film's kind of um, not been at the forefront for a very long time. And I think being able to kind of infuse that into the arts, I think is going to be major. And then looking at the stuff that um, they're doing at Mad Arts with these immersive experiences and the projections, kind of tying in technology and the art, and that has a filming component to it. Um, I think serendipitously, or, or, or it, it just kind of, kind of all kind of coming together. So I think those things are really, really huge, and able for us to be able to promote the arts and showcase the arts here. And Phil, any uh, other thoughts on some other opportunities or areas? Well, I think I think. Um, the opportunities are endless and we're at a, I've only been here two years and I don't know, nine months or, or something at this point. Um, I got here May, May of 19. So everyone, everything that everyone tells me is that this is the, an exciting time to be here. This all comes with a double-edged sword uh, <laughs> as my rent goes up $400 a month uh, in, in March, but that's, a, <laughs> that's another story. But there's so many people moving here, right? There are people moving here from, from, uh, the West Coast from New York uh, and and people moving here and, and not to say anything about folks that, that live here but but people are going to demand certain things that they're used to and if they're here or if they're not here um, we've got to be prepared to rise to the occasion so we've got a very supportive County Commission uh, there are a lot of exciting things happening at the city of Fort Lauderdale in arts and culture they've created a cultural affairs officer position uh, which is a brand new position um, and, and some other staff to support that. You know, the, the working for the county provides great opportunities and we have a lot of opportunities to make some significant change at the same time. Within Broward County, you have 31 independent cities that may or may not want to go where the county has decided it wants to go with arts and culture. So having strong partners at the municipal level gives me at the county level people to work with and people to, you know, that, that can affect similar change and move things at the city level. I can say we want to go in this direction all I want, but if, if, if uh, there's not buy-in at all levels of our, uh, of the government and, and, and the community, then, you know, you just sort of spin your wheels. So I think that's where a lot of the opportunity lies and, and where my work then focuses much like Sandy's is trying to make policies as, as arts friendly as possible so that you can kind of pull back the bureaucracy of government and let what's here and the opportunity to kind of grow organically instead of just, you know, like saying, I'm going to plant this here and plant this here. It's already here. We just need to, you know, pull back the curtains, let the sun shine and, and let the water flow in the garden is going to. The garden is going to grow. But, you know, you're right about the municipalities and, you know, working with them and trying to educate them, I would say, on, you know, arts and culture, film, all of it, so that they understand what it brings. And that takes time. It takes right. time and nurturing and nurturing relationships and showing, you know, not just ta talking about it, but showing. And, and take, know? sorry, not to, but, but take film, for example. Uh, and, and I know one of the challenges previously is each of the 31 cities might have their own um, rules about filming and they might have their own, you know, each city has to sign off on a film permit that's happening, you know, it's happening and it's going to be different people. So, right. So, but then the county is the one that's processing. So, so unless you've got continuity and this goes for the broader arts and culture sector across all of it, these are the kinds of barriers that, that, that prohibit or that, that make this potentially not a place that, uh, arts organizations or artists or or people in the film industry want to come because they've got to try and figure out how to navigate this bureaucracy where uh, on this side of the street you've got one policy and on this side of the street you might have another you might have another policy.
but you know, some, some, and I say this because that still does happen where policies are different, but it is how you, I want to say how you garner it, how you, um, how, you know, for us, anyhow, how we communicate that and be the conduit and the, I want to say the, the, the conduit between, a, let's say, a production company or the, um, you know, uh, you know, the production community, film industry stakeholders, and the government. Mm -hmm. And so as being that conduit, you know, we have to actually speak for both sides. So we have to protect, you know, our municipalities and, and the, the county. But on the same side, we're trying to bring in and make it easier. But for us to be that in between and to be that spokesperson so that when a municipality is saying, uh, no, we don't want to do that, the, the filmmaker doesn't hear that. What but then I'm speaking to the municipality and saying, right. well, what can we do? And then we come back and we have a solution so that they're not hearing all of the things that are that might be going on in the background. So that's what we're trying. That, that's what I did in Miami-Dade County, and I'm hoping to do that the same thing here. And yeah. the folks in Georgia a few years ago did a very good job of this, mm -hmm. right. which contributed to hundreds of billions of dollars of economic impact. Mm -hmm. But they have a state, they have a state, state incentive center, program. Right, they do. But I'll tell you something. You know, you say that, it's very true, that money speaks, and that, that's about incentives. But when, if you talk to any, any producer that's in Georgia, they will tell you it is not film friendly, Correct. right? So, but the money outweighs the film friendliness. But what attracts, you know, the, the first the first thing is actually having an office that actually can, you know, can service production. And that's one thing that's talked about in this industry very much is that if you don't have an office that can actually, you know, actually know how to cut the red tape and do all that. The money, actually, it'll cost you more money than the incentive that they're giving you. So that's, you know, that's part of, very much part of bringing in, you know, uh, production here is that we have to make sure that our, our house is in order, right? And that we are we are showing that part of it off. That's that's actually number one. There's three things that are asked. The, the, the first thing that's asked is how much, you know, what kind of incentive you have. The second thing that's asked is what kind of infrastructure, studios, and crew do you have. And the third thing is how strong is your film office in regards to, um, you know, um, helping the the production. So we're intending on doing all three. And uh, something <laughs> that we used to talk about in this conversation uh, in previous iterations was the strength of the arts helps with something called attracting and retaining talent. How many of you guys have had friends that have had to leave to go other places to find work, to pursue their craft, their passion, their creative outlet, their profession? Uh, my previous videographer, when we first started, uh, used to live in Seattle Ben Artist Loft at a discounted reduced rent, and he moved to Georgia, where he's now making Netflix shows and killing it. Yeah. And unfortunately, that same opportunity at the time when we didn't really have a film commissioner a few years ago wasn't there. We lost one of our most talented, a few of our most talented filmmakers. If anybody remembers BJ Goldick, this guy was shooting, you know, for National Geographic, and I digress. But when you have a strong arts and culture scene and a strong arts and culture community, that not only helps us attract these talented, skilled workers, investors, art collectors, people that are going to support the arts. But it also helps us retain talented, skilled workers to work these necessary jobs in the arts and culture industries, the tech sectors, so on and so forth. We all know, because we all pretty much live here, right, that yep. this is a beautiful place. We all choose 954. Um, but Sandy, what makes Broward County visually distinct and attractive for production? for production, and what sort of outreach will you be doing uh, to filmmakers? Okay, so what, what makes it very attractive is there, it's so diverse. So, you know, you look at Hollywood Beach, that's tropical. You look at the south part of Fort Lauderdale Beach, that's tropical. When you go northern on beach, then that's more like the Pacific, like, like Los Angeles. You go to Markham Park, it looks like Colorado. You go to T.Y. TY Park, it looks like Connecticut. Downtown um, uh, Hollywood can be any town in the Northeast. So the diverse amount of locations that we have here is so attractive. Um, and I don't think that has been, you know, actually, you know, uh, shown to the world, all of the different, the diverse locations that we have. What was the second part of the question so was? The second, yeah. what, 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 what sort of outreach will you be doing uh, to reach filmmakers? Well, I'm gonna tell you, I'm not, right now I'm not doing any outreach and I'm gonna tell you why. Because I, what I told you about before is we have to get our house in order first. Mm -hmm. Now that's not to say that all my contacts haven't been calling me and saying, 
when you're having an incentive, are you going to build studios? We want to come. So that's the great part of, you know, that I'm bringing to the table is my, my relationships with global Hollywood. But that said, you know, I'm, I'm still in the process. I don't even have staff yet. So I've only been there three weeks. So I need to have staff. <laughs> staff has to be, be trained in regards to all of the different rules and all the different municipalities as they are now. And then after that, then I start creating policy and working with the county as the, the departments, as well as all those municipalities to make it film friendly. And then I reach out because it has to be in that order. Right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let's go. And, and I have to I have to say the the county commission has been very oh. supportive. I mean they've committed funds, they've committed money. Uh, uh, Mayor Geller, whose term ended last uh, last fiscal year, um, is largely responsible for really pushing this through. So so the county is committed to to, to doing it, which I I think is encouraging and. and Having you here as the film commission, we we just we met on we met on the phone. Yeah, but we, this yeah is the first time we did, it was meeting in person, even though we're we're both county employees. So. <laughs> I know, and we're like just like a block away, but we're so busy that yeah, we have no, no. So anyway, it, it's it's it, great having you. Well, well, thank you. I I mean I I wanted you to know that I can't. There was a reason I came here, and the reason I came. I mean I was in Miami Dade County. I wasn't looking for another job, honestly. But you know, seeing Broward County, knowing Broward County, living here for thirty years. And then the opportunity coming up, and film commission jobs don't come up often at all, let alone the next county over, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I really, I really felt that I wanted to bring what I could bring to the table to bring everybody together. And you know, it, it's interesting talking about the arts community and what I've felt here. And I was having this conversation before we came here is that I feel that the arts community in Broward is so much more collaborative than it is in Miami-Dade. And I'm not knocking Miami-Dade because I was there forever, but I'm just saying that the feeling that I get here, and, the, and even when I outreach to different communities, I feel that the, 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 there's the desire to have the creative economy here. And the one thing that I say is, as, as we grow and we get bigger, because we are going to get bigger in all ways, whether it be film or art or otherwise, that we make sure that we keep that collaboration because that's what's going to keep us attractive. Amen. And uh, just a quick note, if you guys aren't familiar about the impact of the arts in the place right down the road in Miami, does anybody remember Miami before our fossil? Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, yeah. honestly, it was Paradise Lost. And you, know, you could watch a very, very good film called Cocaine <laughs> Cowboys yes. by Billy Corbin, and he will tell you very distinctly how it transformed to what it is now, which we can all pretty much agree Miami is, is pretty much the cultural capital of Mecca, at least of the, uh, North America and the United States, if not of the world. And especially during our fossil time, when easily, uh, last reported it was $550 million were dumped into the creative economy for one week of art. That was before COVID. I mean, they, they're, they've literally revolutionized their city through the growth and success and the impact of the arts. So what if we were to come together we're catching up a few years behind, but what, what if we were to come together over our Arts Week here right now during Fort Lauderdale and Design Week and have people fly from around the world and purchase more homes and invest in more art, so on and so forth. We'll see the benefits continue to trickle. They're naming new development projects in Miami Basel, literally uh, a new building. So that's that really goes to show right down the street, a few, few minutes down the road, the impact of the arts uh, in a place uh, like Miami we met. Uh, Philip, what is your response to critics who don't think government funds should be going to the arts? Everyone feels their own uh, their own initiatives are, are the greatest and the and the best and the most deserving of, of funding. I think it's somewhat of a false um, comparison to think that we have to be. I mean, unfortunately, this is the way the conversation usually happens. You know, because of mostly because of politics and and I think special interests. Um, but I, I don't think the conversation needs to be or has to be or should even be. It's an either or. It's a both and. And so if it's something that's important to us, then it's something that uh, has to be invested in. And so we don't have to give up the arts funding in order to have affordable housing. And we don't have to give up arts funding in order to uh, in order to work on um, you know, problems with uh, with food insecurity and, and these kinds of things, we can have both, and the arts can play a role in a lot of these these solutions, right? I mean, in St. Louis, I created an education program that worked on it was an after school program to help keep kids off the street that used the arts to meet um, uh, juvenile uh, uh, outcomes, you know, recidivism, like all this all this kind of stuff. So, so the arts has a role to play in it. Um, so. Um, you know, 
I think some of it's noise that we have to cut through. I think um, arts funding shouldn't be uh, controversial. It does often kind of get one of the first things to cut because when you get in, say, a financial crisis or, or things like that, you know, there are other, you know, things at work too. So, you know, during the financial crisis in, in 09, I know that the division, the cultural division suffered huge losses in funding and, and, and staff. And I, you know, I, I think we're probably about 40% of what we were, you know, in 2009, 2008, you know, budget wise, but we're, we're coming back and things are, things are looking great. So I don't know if I trailed off on, the, on a tangent, but, but, but this is where, you know, folks like you come in because if it's important, then you have to, you have to advocate for what, what it is that you want. Right. And this is where, uh, communicating on a regular basis with your county commissioners, with the city commissioners and whatever city that you live in is so important to the process, the relationship building, the cultivation, the letting pe those people that control the purse strings. My budget, I'm a county agency, it comes from the county commission and the budget process. So if residents are calling, uh, saying this is important to me, we want more, then it helps, it helps me do my job more effectively because then I'm not the only one that's talking to the commission and county administration about the importance of art and culture. It's being reinforced from the, from the other side. Amen, okay. Ad ad advocacy is vital. Um, and it's so easy. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah. And, and it's also on the state level because you, the, the county receives funds from the, from the state right. on the state level. So And I was just, just in Tallahassee yeah, meeting um, with these, legislators up in Tallahassee because we're getting to the, the point where the, um, the committee budgets are going to start coming out. So I met with as many of the mm -hmm. TED uh, committee members uh, as I could because Florida went from being third in the nation in arts funding uh, to 48th in the nation for arts oh, no. funding. Yeah. And now we're around about, I think, 26 or so oh, no. um, when, when the when uh, <clears throat> the MSD shooting happened and then Hurricane, I think, mm -hmm. Irma yeah. uh, happened yeah. around the same time. A lot of money was diverted. Yeah. And if you take your eyes off it, you know, mm -hmm. it, once the money goes away, it's really hard to get it back. Right. So we've gotten a little more than half of it back, but we're still we're still just so far off the mark. So I was up in Tallahassee last week meeting with legislators, you know, and it's, it's everybody's sort of, it's something everybody can do that helps, yeah. that helps keep it part of the conversation. Yeah. And I will say like the advocacy thing does definitely work. I mean, I've reached out to city commissioners and county commissioners um, about several things. I mean, the public art and I'm getting more public art things going on and they did listen and they, they've created a, a whole new um, advisory board for public art. And as, as, as well as the Film Commission, yeah, okay. several emails and conversations and turned into Film Summit, just really talking about the different things that, that, that we needed to do in Broward County. Um, and there were replies back and they, they, they were all really interested. Obviously, you have to have your data to be able to provide yeah. them with that data for them to, you know, kind of validate, you know, what you're trying to do. But I, I would say I've been really, really um, enthusiastic about the response with regards to arts over the last, I would say, couple of years um, in terms of them really listening to things that, you know, have kind of come out and obviously you want to be able to get some other people to also reach out and, and ask questions and then provide their input. But um, just really quick, just because they, they like to hear when, when they like to hear what things you want, what's going to make the quality of life better here. They don't just want to hear from you when you're pissed off about the, the traffic signals, you know, the timing or, or, you know, the, you know, closing Vandals. lanes of traffic, yeah. stuff, yeah. stuff like that. Right. So, so yeah. calling your, your elected officials and involving them in like, what's going to make this community better. And if it's the arts and, and those are two good examples. I mean, the film commission at the County level and, and the, the art stuff that's happening at the Fort, the city of Fort Lauderdale level. I mean, a lot of that happened because residents called and said like, this is something that we want. And, they list. I recall we all went to advocate uh, right after you got the job to uh, to City Hall because um, the development community was not in favor of art and public places at that time. They were pushing back, and uh, we went to speak in favor of in, uh, implementing AIPP. Um, are you guys familiar with AIPP, art and public places, new development projects? The developer is supposed to allocate in dozens of municipalities in the state, hundreds across the country. They literally have an ordinance where on new development projects, a hundred million dollar development, they have to put one percent to public art. Okay, instead of making a hundred million, now you're going to make ninety nine million for for round numbers and examples. And for some reason, uh, the development community here was against that. And where is the art funding supposed to come from? Just from Phil and the in the culture division? 
And now, thankfully, we have new policies in play and we've seen great projects come out of the AFPP at the county level and at the city levels, municipality levels. So advocacy really can make an impact mm -hmm. and um, not just the bad stuff, but the good stuff too. I just want, can I please, add something about advocacy? Please. So, you know, in the in the industry in regards to incentives, that's part of my job also is going to Tallahassee, speaking to legislators and also creating policy and, you know, the actual bills. Actually, I, I'm vice president of Film Florida, which is the nonprofit um, uh, industry stakeholder um, organization in the state. And so we actually create the bills that are in Tallahassee. But, you know, talking about advocacy is so important. And we, we speak about this all the time. You need to tell your story. You need to tell your personal story to your, whether it be your, your commissioners locally, whether it be on the state level, or even on the federal level. Really important to tell your personal story and how your art or your you know what your experience is and you know what it means to you to have you know art in your life and whether it be film or art or otherwise and 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 those stories are what resonate because mm -hmm. afterwards you know when you leave and you tell a good story and a good story meaning the personal story um, that that that's left with them and that's what changes that, that is what changes minds yeah, talking about ways that um... We can get other people into the conversation. Philip, during the pandemic, you held regular conference calls with artists to brainstorm ideas for ways to respond to the situation. Uh, any creative outcomes come from those efforts? Well, I mean, um, surprise, surprise, people, uh, artists, organizations, they need money. <laughs> you don't uh, say. Really? <laughs> and, 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 but, but they also need money with like as few strings attached as possible, right? Sometimes mm. in my industry, not only in the government sector, especially just with red tape, but um, in, in the foundation, and, and um, you know, we think we have to have all of this huge, massive process in order to have access to funds. Um, we're making some some small changes. Like one of the change, one of the, it's actually a big change. It seems like might seem like a small change, but um, we used to pay all of our grants as reimbursements. So the project would be done, and then you would bill us. You would bill us because that's the way government works right fee for service you give us an invoice we see it's been done uh, right but a grant to support arts and culture is not uh, an rfp it's not a i you know um I, i'm not soliciting w moda to to do a uh you know to create and and run an art museum they're coming to us and saying this is what we do and we're saying we we appreciate and recognize the value that you bring to this community we want to ensure that that you're able to continue continue to do that so now we pay all of our grants up front once the contract is signed so because that helps with cash flow that helps with you know you're not then robbing peter to pay paul in order to do your projects um so th that's you know one of the one of the small changes we we did a lot of tracking of data in the beginning of COVID on economic impact and surprise surprise the it was quite great uh, to the arts community so at a certain point we stopped tracking because i thought well you know it's already bad so it's saying it's, <laughs> it's even worse that's that i mean we already know it's bad right so uh luckily i'll say from a um uh, we kept things going we were overhauled our grants process during the pandemic uh, we didn't lose any funding um you know there were organizations that didn't get all of their grants during the pandemic because they couldn't do the projects that they had proposed initially obviously because of covid it just wasn't possible to do it but we didn't lose any funding and in fact this year we got a two hundred thousand dollar increase in our grants budget um so we're we've been working on getting our house in order because uh, so much of that was just neglected over the over the decades so we spent the pandemic um you know trying to trying to listen, trying to get ideas. But at the end of the day, uh, organizations and artists and creatives, they need access to capital, they need access to funding, and they need access to funding in a way that um, doesn't put them in a precarious uh, situation from a cash flow standpoint, uh, that doesn't uh, create needless paperwork and endless outcomes that you have to figure out what a, what, you know, how to create a measurable outcome for a, you know, for a, a, a symphony concert, it's like, well, damn it, I just did the concert. Isn't that isn't that the outcome? You know, we're not we're, we're not saving lives here necessarily. So, um, I don't know if that answered the no, question. No, that's good. You know, uh, perspective, real world economic impact of you supporting an artist and the creative economy. When you purchase a piece of artwork from a local artist, they are then able to take those funds and go to the art supply store so they can continue buying canvases and paint and continue pursuing their craft, their passion, their creative outlet, profession, 
And like when we're love them, I, I don't care about preferences. <laughs> Places like Jerry's and mm -hmm. Blick and Arteza and the art supply companies can continue staying in business. But, just, but beyond, beyond that, or, or on a bigger level, uh, an arts organization, uh, we'll just say a mid-sized organization is going to have an executive director, is going to have administrative assistants, might have a finance person, is going to have a fundraiser, is going to have marketing. So you have people in all these industries that are not necessarily artists, but they, they might, they, and, and those people have families, those people drive cars, those people have homes, they pay rent. So all the money that's, that's given, it might go to support the larger part of the organization, but these are people's lives. These are like, I mean, just because somebody works uh, in finance for an arts organization doesn't mean that their role is any less important or the money has any less significance than working for a financial corporation, right? This, is, this is still jobs and, and people's lives. And the other great example right? with like the Broward Center for Performing Arts, when you go support the Performing Arts Center, they're able to pay the graphic designer making the flyer, the usher, the valet, people that base their livelihood on working in this industry. So that I wanted to give some context and bigger picture of how your dollars can tangibly change an artist's life, career, uh, uh, practice, and literally allow this cycle to continue flowing because I always like to uh, make this point. Nobody wants to live in a city or community devoid of life, color, and, and art. And I always pick on Youngstown, Ohio, but nobody wants to live in a place where it's like brown and gray all the time, right? You want to live in a place where there's murals, where there's art walks, where there's art fairs, where there's things to do. Um, so we're really glad to support that in the arts. We're going to, uh, we'll, we'll close on this last question, then we'll turn over to question and answer before we go to the cocktail reception afterwards. Um, Andrew and myself have, uh, have seen the impact of the arts and, and thankfully been able to contribute with things like Zero Empty Spaces. We hear these amazing stories from the artists, how their lives have uh, been able to be changed. But um, another real challenge is tackling racial disparities in the art world. Um, Andrew, any plans or thoughts, and Phil as well, on how we can address this issue from the chairs we're sitting in? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think creating platforms for people to showcase and 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 you know showcase their talents, I think, is huge. Um, you know, I think, you know, like Ignite's a good example of this platform of these site specific things for artists to come and, and showcase and there are artists from different parts of the country that are there and, and of different nationalities and ethnicities as well. So I think platforms are huge and creating more of those platforms are, are really big. I know the, the architectural um, association has, has their architectural fair this week as well. And again, there's a platform for architects to be able to showcase. And so I think creating those platforms and having those platforms, I think is a huge part of it. You want to oh, say oh, I, can, I can go on to this, this subject forever. <laughs> so so um, when it comes to the, the film industry, um, you know, this has been a, obviously a conversation, you know, uh, Oscar's so white. I mean, you, we've, we've all heard it. It has changed the industry um, and, and actually in some incentive programs uh, across the country that there is, it has to be an inclusion, equity inclusion, that you have to hire, you know, a certain amount of diversity in your, um, in your crew when you're hiring to get the money. So it, things have changed in, in that space. Uh, there's an um, organization called Array. Array is was started by Ava DuVernay. If you know who she is, she's the director. Um, she's a she's a she's a, a black director, and she is um, very well known. And she started this organization that actually you know um, really spreads diversity. It is actually where you uh, you sign up, and, and it, everybody can sign up, but it focuses on minorities, women, you know, people of color, uh, and. And it's basically a directory so that others can find those artists and those you know filmmakers and those crew members and it is actually making a big splash and I'll say that in Miami um, I contacted them when I first heard about them and I'm gonna you know I'm already already in contact with them for Broward when I first um, heard about the array and um, we partnered with them and became a test city for uh, array when they first started and so they understand the importance of this community it has to be, it has to come from, you know, I want to say a, a, a bigger place. Th that's helping, um, I want to say across the nation, that's really helping diversify the, the industry. And it's really very important. I'll also say education wise, starting, you know, what you, you, with underserved kids, and I'm going to look somebody that's in the back that has uh, Ron Baez who, and um, uh, Devin Marsh who have a, Ron is um, part of the White Elephant Group and there's an, 
think Kevin's over there too, um, and the After School Film Institute, which started in Miami, and hopefully it's moving this way, where you know they they've worked with the underserved community and teaching you know film, and 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 that's really important because you know the, the opportunities are, should be for everybody, especially since you know the, the median salary in the film industry in the state of Florida, not measured by us, but the state, is eighty nine thousand dollars a year. Everybody should have the opportunity to be able to make that kind of money, to be able to understand that you don't even need a, a college education to be in this this industry, and it has to start from actually from public schools and teaching in public schools. I will eventually get there. When eventually, <laughs> that, that's part of that. It's very important. How is it spelled? Sorry, array. How do you spell array? A R R A Y. And by all means, uh, if we're we're going to open up for questions, and you can uh, engage with the panelists afterwards as well, and connect social media, email, and all that good stuff. Um, this has been. Do you want me to? I, I don't want to. I wasn't trying to like. No. I wasn't trying to like weasel out because it, because it's every question, so I wasn't trying to, to punt it to to Sandy and be like, oh, I don't have to answer the race the race question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, for you know, for me, so much of it, you know, we talked about Andrew talked about platforms and, and providing the platform is certainly one thing. You know, for us, it's it's a lot about creating accessibility, and a lot of times in government, especially in other ways, we we can we we can for you know, if only for just a lack of knowledge of other people's situations and where they come from, create barriers that we think are put in place in order to be good stewards of public money, but end up just being barriers to access, being barriers. I mean, something as simple as like recognizing that that um, so many people in, in Broward County uh, don't speak English or English may not be their first language. So if we're truly going to serve the arts community and provide access to to needed funding for arts organizations, then maybe our application shouldn't only be in English or maybe our application workshop shouldn't only be in English. So um, or or uh, <clears throat> we need to recognize that that, um, you know, we've got to we, we've got to be careful about uh, uh, and, and this is not a commentary on any organization here in Broward County. So I'm not saying this in, in any in any failed way, but you know, we've got to be careful about how large, well-funded, majority white institutions are telling stories and experiences of people of color, right? So we have to listen to the, the community, we have to listen to the artists and the, and the voices uh, and, and provide the platform for people to tell their own stories and experiences through art. And we have to make sure that the processes that we create and the processes that are those uh, uh, that are sort of those entryways into the system and into the process don't have barriers that we create because we think we're being good stewards, but we but out of ignorance of mm -hmm. of of understanding of of who we're ultimately trying to serve that we create barriers to access. So, um, you know, uh, we did our first uh, grant uh, workshop in a language other than English. Uh, we're, we're working uh, recently. We did Spanish. Uh, we're working on getting our, our grant process, um, our applications uh, uh, in Spanish or in another language so that if English isn't your first language, you're not penalized, you know, because, you know, uh, because of that. Uh, things like making sure our grant panelists don't um, don't take points off for spelling because English may not be someone's first language. So spelling and grammar shouldn't be things that we judge. You can recognize artistic process and substance even though somebody may not be able to 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 write, you know, quote unquote, proper English or what what we consider or what somebody, you know, in the normative sense, you know, considers. So we've got to learn how to recognize uh, aesthetic and quality of product and process through, you know, these things that we create as sort of standards about what is good and what is what is right and what is what is quote unquote normal. And we've got to make sure that we're not putting a lot of these barriers in place you know, unintentionally that have these sort of unintended, unintended consequences. So that's a great thing. That's well really put. Great. Very well. Very well put. There's a lot we can do, you know. All this is a lot of this is about addressing systemic issues in government. Hey, we're the system, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so we've got to work from the inside to unravel these things. And my counterpart in Miami uh, Michael Springs yes. told me when I first got the job, he said, one of the things that will keep you going is showing up every day to work with an anger at the government system because that <laughs> is what keeps you motivated to constantly try and change things. Well, that's, yes. To, to, you know, yeah, uh, that's it. So I'm still here. <laughs> Art is history. Art is storytelling. Art is place-making. Place -making. Arts can do so many things. 
so many communities changed, so many people's lives. I wasn't in art two years ago. Arts had a profound impact on my life, able to give back to my native home community in Broward County here that my father somehow decided to move to 30 something years ago. And um, I'm forever grateful for the arts. I'm forever grateful for you guys taking time out of your lives to come here and join us, um, be part of this conversation, contribute to the conversation, and hopefully we can have this be a thriving arts and cultural community for generations to come so that our kids don't have to leave to go other places to pursue their craft, their passion, their creative outlet, or their profession. You should be able to be an artist here in Broward County 